We've just uh, switched over our, our AV system, so give us a couple of minutes and we'll be underway. Hi everyone, thank you very much for coming. We're gonna get started. My name is Gavin Browning. I'm the Director of Events and Public Programs here at Columbia University GSAP. It's great to see you here tonight. And um, if you're interested in the program here at GSAP, please feel free to grab a poster and events lineup in the back of the room. Um, tonight, I'm pleased to welcome you to a launch for this book, Market Menagerie, Health and Development in Late Industrial States by Professor Smita Srinivas. Smita Srinivas, sorry. She is a professor of urban planning here at GSAP and the director of the Technological Change Lab, also known as the TC Lab, uh, as well as a faculty associate at the South Asian Institute. TC Lab connects economic theory with development planning practice. It also conducts research on technological change and the political economy of institutions and governance around growth and equity. Smita's training is in economics and economic development planning and she has published work in journals such as World Development, Theory and Society, Regional Studies, European Planning Studies, and Technology and Society. And um, I encourage you to, to check out this book, which is available for sale by Book Culture in the back of, of the room. And I'm sure Smita would be happy to sign it, if, if so. So I'll, please welcome Smita. Thank you all for <clears throat> braving the cold weather. Um, I am originally from India. This is very, very cold for me from where I am uh, originally from. So the fact that all of you have come out uh, is, um, is um, happiness enough for an organizer. So I want to uh, first uh, very quickly thank Gavin, who's our very capable events manager here, um, Charlotte Egerton, May Yu, Sean Ansonelli for getting some of you into the room tonight and for just helping us with logistics. Um, it's really a wonderful chance uh, for a wider conversation and the book is really a very simple launching pad into what I hope is a much deeper conversation about the issue of health. Um, I come from a, a background where I'm focused much more on technology and development issues um, and my panelists all come from very different backgrounds of their own and I'll have the pleasure of introducing them in a, in, in a minute. Um, the panel's charge today is really to debate the complexity and narrative challenges of health. And we're going to be doing this obviously quite um, uniquely situated in our respective disciplines and professional practices. And uh, they come from urban design and ecology, photojournalism, um, uh, people like myself from economics, uh, folks uh, from medical humanitarian issues and, and wider communication challenges. And uh, we're going to be debating and inviting all of you into a much wider debate about the best ways in which to convey uh, some of the complexities of health and um, some of the challenges of issues such as access to health care. And uh, we're going to be debating it from the perspective of communication and narrative. And we're going to be asking ourselves questions such as, uh, do we need to speak to all the complexity? Can we simplify? How do we simplify? Which are some of the most effective uh, ways in which we communicate and narrate uh, more widely? Now, um, <clears throat> there were three questions that troubled me in the book. And I'm using the book really as a launching pad for a wider conversation, as I said. And the three questions really came to me because just like you, um, situated in your respective professions and in academia, I was struggling to make sense uh, with very, very different professional communities who often didn't speak to each other. And these communities were health practitioners, uh, economists, NGOs, activists, labor uh, union um, uh, practitioners and, and scholars of their own. Um, looking at government officials, and I found that 
for, the, for about 10 years, I was at a meeting after meeting where people were simply unable to communicate. And um, although everybody in the room was often agreed, um, probably just like we will all be, that healthcare is an essential uh, thing for most of us, and all of us should have access to it in some form, I was really struck by some of the uh, big gaps in, in the way in which people told their stories and the ways in which people understood the lessons from what somebody else had just mentioned. So the three questions that, that um, I came to really were, uh, came from questions that I had seen working with unions, um, working on government policy, and working with the health industry. So the three questions were, how can these countries, especially those, that have the capability of producing medicines, vaccines, diagnostic kits, surgical tools, how do they ensure that their own populations get them? What kinds of markets are the best for this? And what are the implications for countries, uh, especially when they privilege life science development as an economic strategy? And this last one was especially important, and I'll explain it um, as we go ahead. So my narrative choices, in a way, and this is the lead-in to the panel, because you will hear very different narrative choices, really emerged from sheer frustration and, of course, great curiosity about the ways in which people were communicating these issues. And um, so if I really try to describe what I did, I took a historical perspective. I looked at one country for 50 years I try to connect market language with non-market language, which for many of you, uh, you would understand that this is easier said than done. We might all disagree that markets are the main mechanism to look at access to healthcare, uh, but without it, uh, it would also be very challenging to describe uh, how sometimes markets can work very well. And my hope was to be integrative, which was really to look not just at production, not just a delivery or a demand, but really to look at all three simultaneously, and this completely changed the way I wrote the book. It's an explicitly comparative national debate. I didn't have to pick that, but it, for me, was the narrative that worked the most effectively, because I could show systematically how extraordinarily few countries in the last 100 years had successfully combined to do production, delivery, and demand successfully all at once. And at the end, especially for those of you who are from uh, disciplines where the urban question um, remains important, I really asked, I came to the urban issue last. I didn't begin there. Uh, and there was a reason for it, and we can discuss it uh, at the end. But I really said, where does the city fall within this debate? Especially because the last question, what are the implications for life science economic strategies, are situated within cities. So the type of narrative that I've used in the book, it's not the only one, um, but uh, this, is an this is sort of an example of the kind of narrative I used in some instances. This was something that came out of the vaccine chapter. And it took an awful lot of product and process analysis and a huge amount of interviewing uh, with firms, lots of organizational studies, to capture sort of the evolving capabilities of how developing country firms in vaccine segments were gradually becoming more and more and more sophisticated. And at the same time, there was no direct correlation between uh, their capabilities and the ability of the country uh, to expand or get vaccines to its own population. So what was quite interesting in this piece of analysis was that countries became very successful through their firms, and those firms increasingly depended on the welfare states of other countries. That is, they exported more and more, and the challenge to regulate firms uh, and force them to attend to their domestic um, constituents was becoming more challenging, not less. So the theme that I raise in the book is why, should, why is it that we imagine that with increasing technological capability, we necessarily imagine that our domestic health politics becomes simplified. On the contrary, it becomes far more complicated. So we are in a, in a new place in the world. 
we have what we call the world's new pharmacy. And uh, not only, I would urge every single one of you, by the way, um, the, the last time you, you took uh, um, medicine, were, were given a vaccine, uh, you had surgery or anything else, I would really urge you, in fact, I've become quite obsessive. Um, my family members find me very strange. The first thing I do is to open the packaging and look in the back and say, where did this come from? And this is as true of surgical instrumentation and medical devices as it is of vaccines and, and generic drugs. Most of it now comes uh, from other places. And it's a very, very interesting thing to try and map kind of a new global map of where things come from. And uh, it's another manifestation of what, what some people call globalization, but I find the term to muddy a lot of the tensions uh, and is, is not very revealing when I use that term. It's much, much more interesting to actually look product by product, uh, skill by skill, and try and understand what has happened to our world map. And what is rather remarkable about uh, what we see here is that um, for certain segments, I, I put the case of uh, HIV medication here, but it could have been uh, measles. Um, one uh, half of all world measles um, capability and the products come from, from one firm in the world. Um, if you look at uh, antiretroviral medication, um, you see that one country alone produces about 90% uh, of the global purchase volume in 2008, and um, is similarly an awful lot of countries now buy from a single source. Now, these are not interesting in a wider, more diffuse debate about um, just the changing geography. What was the most interesting uh, when, when doing this work, and I would urge you again to go out and, and look at where all your medicines and uh, vaccines are made, is to try and understand um, exactly how the capabilities in these countries, the growing capabilities, are changing their domestic politics of healthcare. And the more the welfare states of one part of the world become connected to another, we have some very interesting little political dilemmas to resolve in these places. And urban healthcare systems fall out in different ways depending on the product. So uh, in the book, um, one uh, challenge was the case of, of biotech regions. And if you look at this, you see that, of course, uh, in the Americas, particularly in North America, you have quite predictable life science um, uh, agglomerations. We see several of them here. Many of you know that in New York uh, City, the new biotech um, as economic development strategy is growing quite, quite strongly. Uh, similarly, you see Baltimore, um, and uh, you see San Francisco, San Diego, and so forth. Um, and when you look across at Asia um, and Africa, you see some of the new clusters developing. And we, of course, have to ask what this means in terms of the repercussions of an economic development strategy whose assumed goal is um, better healthcare uh, access. And these other uh, clusters simply show us the divisions of bioscience clusters, particularly the high growth um, biotech industry, which is seen in the yellow in the bottom graph. And um, this chart up here looks at the American Planning Association and lists those places that have relatively well-developed public health plans to uh, take into account many different dimensions of public health, not just the kind that I was concerned with in the book, but more comprehensive kinds of approaches to public health. And those are the red uh, areas. So you see that most of the country, even in the US, isn't thinking about this very, um, very much in an integrated manner. So when we look at the status um, of health, we see that the number of, it's as low as 10% when we think of the number of people attended to by a skilled health worker when they have a baby. Attending to those problems in about 49 countries, which is actually not the entire world, it's, it's a, it's a sub-segment of the world, would save about 700,000 700, lives. 
if you had uh, basic services gaps for children under five, you would save about 16 million lives um, between here and uh, 2015. These were the projections done a couple of years ago by the WHO. Um, the financial burden for this healthcare is tremendous. All of you recognize this. It's been in the newspapers day in and day out. But 150 million people annually suffer financial catastrophe dealing with healthcare even when it is available. And 100 million are estimated to be pushed below the poverty line. 20% has broad-based social security and over half the world lacks any type of formal social protection more widely. I want to give you three examples on a more hopeful note of campaigns, organizations and efforts that I think have have done a good job getting the news out and focusing in on very specific interventions. This is a case from um, the infographics are from uh, Médecins Sans Frontier, and we have Jason Cohn to talk more about that later uh, today. Um, this is a type of example of a very, very targeted message that keeps hammering away at one aspect of things. And this is just an example of the work they do on vaccines, talking about the need to make vaccines easier to use where there is clearly a technology component to making them easier to use, and then in tandem, making them more affordable. Here's another example, and this was where I actually started some of my own work on, on health about 15 years ago. Uh, this is an organization which is the world's largest uh, labor union for women workers, and they have a, an insurance program uh, that combines sickness, uh, insurance with a huge range of other types of insurance services and they too have kept on message uh, constantly uh, expanding the stream of what they support and uh, making the connection between economic and social policy much much more obvious and uh, this is the cover of the book it deserves a little explanation <clears throat> the Indian oral pulse polio mission is probably the world's most successful single mission mode project um, that covers about 125 million children in a single day annually uh, in getting oral polio vaccines out. And literally the child is lifted up like this and there's a little drop of uh, polio vaccine administered. Now I really want to emphasize why this is such an interesting case. In all of these three examples of MSF, of SEWA, of huge number of other organizations, of the Indian Polio Mission, there's no given single organization that plugs away. They've all opened out to a very collaborative um, um, endeavor. They all recognize the kinds of, of tensions are quite wide. They have to get new partners into the room. They all think through very systematically the point of the inception of, in the case of my book, it was technologies, but the expertise all the way um, to a very broad spectrum of users and a much bigger conversation about how to make something deliverable. And the Indian oral pulse polio is quite fascinating. When I was in India over December, you had people coming door to door to check off and ensure that every child in the house had had its vaccine. And, uh, you will find it in bus stops, um, healthcare uh, facilities, uh, down the road, uh, in hospitals, schools, all the rest. So the scale of the mission is, is absolutely immense. 650,000 polio boots uh, for that period is, is quite an accomplishment. And uh, we do see um, polio um, uh, being dealt with quite effectively. <clears throat> so three types of hybrid technology and organizational models that I think are quite successful and I hope will lead into some of the kind of new narratives that we might need to get this information across are the OPP that I just mentioned for polio. There has just been a new announcement for open source drug delivery expanded um, in the Indian Institutes of Science in India which are asking people to come in to an open source model and find new ways to do this very systematically. And then what I think to be a very interesting example, again, quite successful, uh, the uh, menafravac meningitis vaccine for Africa that has done uh, quite well. 
And new causes also for optimism, which is the under five mortality rate has dropped in many, many countries, so it's not all gloomy. Uh, but clearly, there are many, many challenges. Uh, economic development does not necessarily lead to better health outcomes. And this is a really important point to remember. You don't have to be a richer place to be a healthier place. And um, this is certainly true of the data that we're seeing uh, for the last two years, quite consistently coming out of some of the global health um, literature. And, but not all narratives are easy to, to convey. And I think this is the charge that I'm going to leave to my panelists uh, to address. There's a big unresolved healthcare challenge in the US, which has quite unique politics and, and tensions. A similar uh, but slightly different challenge is for South Asian workers, um, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and many other countries there, where over 90% of the labor force is informal. Most have no healthcare access through their work. Many of you in the room have access to your healthcare because you work. That model does not work for a lot of the world. Most have some status as workers, which has some political impetus, and I think there's an interesting narrative about what the labor health connection brings about, something I have alluded to in the book and a lot of very, very capable people have written about. And I've done something here to my slide. <laughs> and the last, uh, if we look at, uh, it might take a while. Yeah. Uh, if we look at the uh, three uh, different cases, place-based or residential systems of entitlements around healthcare are disappearing quite fast. And in those places which never had them, they're not growing. The fact that you could be a resident of a city or a town and because of your resident status have access to certain entitlements has not been a debate that has moved um, extensively as well. So uh, with some of these narrative challenges facing us, I'm going to um, introduce our speakers. It's a um, excellent panel. You've chosen well tonight. I'm very pleased uh, to welcome uh, Brian McGrath as our first uh, speaker. Uh, he's Associate Professor and Research Chair in Urban Design at the School of Constructed Environments at Parsons. Um, and he's the founder and principal of Urban Interface, an urban design consultancy in architecture, ecology, and social media. Um, Brian was also a principal researcher in the Baltimore Ecosystem Study, funded by the NSF. And uh, he's been conducting some absolutely fascinating long-term work in Bangkok and Southeast Asia. And um, so I would uh, like Brian, um, how about um, all of our speakers come up for the moment? Uh, and uh, if, or Brian, would you like to come up and just speak from here? Would that be good? Um, I've asked Brian a, a particular question. Um, he has collaborated on uh, health-related studies but his wider work in urban design encompasses some of the very complex things. So welcome, welcome Brian. And um, several of the themes in the book um, have, have some overlay with, with the work that Brian does, but he really sits at a quite fascinating intersection of, of the ways, looking at the ways uh, at which um, cities are changing. And I want him to walk us through some of his influences and what he thinks from his very particular vantage point, especially coming out from the Baltimore and some of the other studies you've done. What do you think the, the main narrative challenges uh, for health and urban issues? Thank you. And, uh, Smith has asked me to do this in 10 minutes, so I just set my alarm. You'll hear crickets in 10 minutes. Um, thank you for inviting me to join this conversation. It's certainly um, a fascinating one. I was um, reluctant, given that uh, I'm not a health expert in any ways, 
But uh, I was happy I did accept um, with a little arm twisting because when I saw the book, I was completely taken. <clears throat> uh, by uh, the argument and I, I wanted to speak five minutes personally um, because I think because I haven't worked professionally specifically around health issues um, but of course uh, all of us confront issues of health access um, health infrastructure health technologies on a daily basis and then five minutes I don't have time to show uh, my work in uh, Baltimore and Bangkok but uh, again, the question um, uh, kind of uh, nudged me to relook at those two cities uh, with the help of Google Earth, and hopefully we'll be able to see it, um, and look at two hospitals in the two cities. Um, okay. So the, the story starts um, with myself, uh, a young graduate of architecture school, uh, arriving in New York in June 1981. Um, and the first slide you, you'll see is, uh, ah, good. Beautiful. Yes. So yes, indeed. Um, thank you so much. Uh, in answer to your question, this challenge is a symptom of a wider complex field of urban design. So as I said, I'm gonna draw from personal experience uh, in the health market uh, menagerie. Um, uh, speaking from the past, um, my experience coming to New York in 1981, um, at the very beginning of the AIDS crisis in New York and in Bangkok in 1997, uh, well into um, uh, the, the crisis as it reached there uh, around 1991. Um, and then now, uh, aging parents, uh, both in New England and Nissan, uh, I have a Thai partner, and so uh, we share responsibility for our parents. And it, it gives me an example, uh, to, a personal example, just to look at those uh, uh, two countries. And then secondly, um, I'm gonna look at uh, these two cities I work extensively in as, as uh, urban ecosystems, um, Baltimore, the University of Maryland Medical Center, um, and John Hopkins Hospital, and in Bangkok, Sirat Hospital, and King Chulunkorn Memorial Hospital. Okay. Um. So, New York City, June 1981. Uh, June 1981 was the month that uh, the New York Stock Exchange started le electronic trading. As you can see, the month I arrived from architecture school with all my mechanical drawing board skills, um, the digital revolution was out, about to begin. Those are the computer terminals uh, that were lowered into the trading floor over one weekend and all the desks and the paper trades. I mean, look at the board in the, in the back. They're sort of uh, manually uh, each trade is transacted there. So a lot has happened in 30 years, um, both uh, to my hair color and to uh, the world. Um, and I arrived in the East Village and it was quite an uh, uproar over the changes brought by that digital revolution. Um, I arrived with lots of artists and performers and uh, uh, underpaid architects and uh, and it, it, and we didn't realize it, but we were the forefront of gentrification. And, uh, and this is a, a scene from the uh, Tompkins Square riots, we can say. Um, and, but also 1981 was the beginning of the Reagan administration. And, uh, and so, um, and the realization that uh, uh, what was called at the time the gay plague, uh, AIDS was, was uh, killing many of our friends. Uh, so, uh, so I, uh, in addition to um, uh, demonstrating on Avenue A for the um, encampment in Tompkins Square, was also Tompkins Square Park was also uh, uh, joined ACT UP, and uh, I mean I think the communication uh, um, design was just something that was quite uh, amazing. Um, but it's quite interesting if you look at journalism. Uh, we have a journalist here as well. Um, the New York Times um, in 1987 had a great difficulty using the word gay. It wasn't until the next year. Um, 
that actually gay rage. Um, both titles are wrong. It wasn't a, a gay protest or a homosexual protest. It was, it was a, a, a group of people united uh, to uh, change the way the Center for Dis Disease Control, the Federal Drug Administration, the National Institute of Health were uh, managing uh, this crisis. And it was um, the Treatment Action Group uh, members from ACT UP who became a kind of lobbying group um, who were most effective in, in uh, making change. If, if uh, those of you in, in the audience who haven't lived through this period, I would highly recommend the recent film, How to Survive a Play. No, no, no. <laughs> um, and that's the, I believe it's the demonstration at the CDC. Um, uh, and then Bangkok. So uh, my, I arrived in New York in 1981 in the midst of an AIDS crisis. My partner arrived in Bangkok in 1991 in the midst of an AIDS crisis. Um, and Thailand's response, uh, according to the UNDP and according to my experience to the HIV AIDS, um, uh, is very impressive. Um, since 1991, um, the, there's been dramatic uh, a decline in, in um, infections, um, and uh, and very very quickly uh, achieved the Millennium Development Goals um, well before the 2015 uh, target uh, date of, of reversing the spread of HIV/AIDS. Um, and clearly, there's a cultural reason for the success. Um, it was uh, it was top down. It was opposite of the kind of uh, social activism that moved the um, unmoving uh, uh, national government institutions in the U.S. It was very much um, uh, a series of um, uh, top level leadership, but also um, a kind of broad based response. Um, uh, ministries, military, non government, schools, um, and uh, and. Uh, in the midst, uh, and when I, when I arrived uh, to, to live in Thailand as a Fulbright scholar, I was sort of uh, taken back to my Tompkins Square days because not only had AIDS traveled across the globe, the vaccine, but also the effects of uh, uh, globalization and the uh, financial uh, trading that was set in motion on the June, more, uh, June weekend in 1981. So here you see the... Uh, the property market uh, bu bubble, the, the devaluation of the Thai bot, and the protest against the IMF Asian Development Bank and the World Bank <coughs> that accompanied me there. But on the other hand, there was a kind of uh, more um, fun kind of uh, demonstration. Uh, and this is, um, I don't know, maybe you know more about these. Um, but the, the, the ability to uh, uh, communicate, make make these issues tangible. Not be afraid to talk about um, men having sex with men, or condoms, or or uh, AIDS, or uh, sex work was was uh, something I think that was was quite courageous um, for basically a conservative culture. I don't know what happened to my alarm. Just checking. Ah, four minutes. All right. Okay. Thank you. Um, so that was then, now, um, taking care of aging and dying parents in New England and Isan. So I come from Springfield, Massachusetts, and uh, at the top is the soldier's home in Holyoke where my father passed away after living there six years, uh, dying of Alzheimer's. Um, East Village Place is where my mom lives now, assisted living across from Redstone. Her sister, she's 86, her sister's 90, just moved across the street because she fell and broke her hip at a rehabilitation center at Redstone. And Wingate at East Long Meadow, where uh, my Uncle Bill, my Aunt May, and uh, Uncle Lefty all passed away in uh, hospice. Uh, so you see the, the, the mill towns along the Connecticut River and the industrial city where I grew up, um, completely uh, deindustrialized, and, and all of these uh, care facilities uh, for an aging. A population located uh, outside the city. And uh, as an architect, I'm not just an urban designer and architect, um, and maybe there's an architect, it's the, the building plans and the urban morphology. So this is uh, Route 91 up to Vermont, uh, Holyoke on the 
uh, right of that slide, and, and you can see the large complex, the soldier's home, which sits on top uh, of uh, Mount Tom in Holyoke, at the edge of the megalopolis, of the Boston-Washington megalopolis. Um, East Long Meadow, Massachusetts is this intersection of seven streets in the top center of the slide, and you can see the, the uh, three care centers where uh, uh, several of my parents and their siblings uh, have uh, ended their lives um, or uh, are enjoying the last uh, years of their lives, as the case of my mother and my aunt. Um, so this is uh, Wingate, the uh, hospice. Uh, this is uh, um, East Village Place, the assisted living, and uh, this is Redstone Rehabilitation Center. Um, so the, it's a story of contrast when we go to the northeast of Thailand from the northeast of the U.S. Um, so my partner is from Ban Nong Sawan, which is uh, just near the Mekong River, which separates Thailand from Laos, uh, and the upper reaches of a dry plain, uh, the poorest region in Thailand. Uh, near cities, uh, Vien Chen Laos, uh, Nong Kai, Udan Thani, um, which of course have the nearest hospitals. Uh, so uh, it was quite difficult to bring uh, aging parents-in-law, I can say, to, um, to get proper uh, care. They subsequently have, have both died. Um, but it was remarkable the kind of um, village level and extended family care and they both died at home um, and surrounded by uh, friends and families and villagers. Uh, so, oops, my comparative matrix of AIDS and aging uh, and uh, America and Thailand. Um, New York, crisis form social activist group, government change, Bangkok, effective government response, behavioral change, New England's greatest generation, the social contract provided technical health care. Uh, American Urban Forum, Isolated Social Support, Work-Based Social Contract Proved Ineffective by Youth Hit by AIDS Crisis. In Isan, 30 Baht Health Scheme, But Where to Go, a Village Extended Family, Support Strong uh, for Elderly, Healthcare, Distant and Adequate, AIDS Prevention Successful, But Care Too Expensive and Technical Uncompensated Care Work. So just a couple of issues to talk about. And then the last couple of minutes, I just want to give you a tour of the sites where I do my research. Uh, so, um, uh, uh, so Baltimore, as I said, um, uh, the two monsters, and it's like the the issues. I, I, I whoops. Okay, <laughs> all right. This will be really quick. The I work mostly in the um, uh, uh, underpopulated inner city neighborhoods of. Uh, West Baltimore on the left of the screen and East Baltimore on the right, right of the screen. And um, even though the mandate is to work with housing and open space and improve uh, water management and ecological resilience in these neighborhoods, uh, we keep on running into these, these two huge institutions. And so one is um, the University of, of Maryland um, uh, medical center, which is, see that highway that just sort of ends into a building? That's the University of Maryland. And, um, and it, it has a huge um, plan for a, a biotechnol biotechnological research center. That's uh, spreading. Uh, I have a detail I can show you. And then, of course, uh, Johns Hopkins, uh, to the right of the screen, um, is... Uh, I don't know if you can see it, but it, again, it's that concentration of dense buildings within a, a basically a row house uh, fabric of the city. Um, here's the a detail of the University of Maryland uh, Medical Center, and you can see the extension in the middle of the slide and uh, all the green space, the demolition of the row houses to, to extend this biomedical complex. <clears throat> And then here's John Hopkins actually looking um, east in this case, so you can see the symmetrical original building at the screen. And this huge uh, urban renewal, you know, uh, come going back to the 60s, the kind of massive removal of housing that took place in anticipation um, of uh, a future biomedical uh, 
research complex in the blocks uh, to the left of the medical complex. You see the parking lots and the green open space where it used to be uh, row houses. <clears throat> so, Bangkok, uh, quite a different story. It uh, uh, continues to be uh, a booming metropolis rather than a shrinking one um, within, a, 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 let's say, a biomedical megalopolis, the Boston-Washington biomedical megalopolis. And so Baltimore, of course, sits in close relationship to the regulatory agencies in the US. Um, so these are two royal hospitals uh, in the foreground. Maybe I can point this out. No. Uh, OK. In the, in, in the f I, I can't. Ah, oh, there it is. OK. So um, uh, this is Sirirat. Sirirat. And uh, this is the Dusit uh, palace district, the Grand Palace. So the kings moved out here at the beginning of the 20th century. This was the current king's residence. And he built uh, this highway when his mother was ill to connect the first hospital in Thailand directly to his front door. Um, and he's been residing for three years in this hospital complex. Um, and the other one, uh, I've been based at Chulalongkorn University, which is in the center of the, more the business district, and um, and the Chulalongkorn, uh, King Chulalongkorn Memorial Hospital is uh, located right here in this complex. And um, and like the two hospitals uh, in Baltimore, they are expanding. Uh, with um, not only uh, biomedical and teaching hospitals and research institu institutions, but also competing with the, the international, private international hospitals in, in Bangkok for medical tourism. So Siraj and Chulalongkorn. And instead of having neighborhoods where they can expand, real estate is too high in Bangkok, and so that's a kind of incredible densification. Both, both sites are huge construction sites right now as they kind of accelerate there. Uh, okay, and finally, um, uh, if uh, uh, Sirarat was the, is the place of great devotion uh, as the king uh, spends his uh, remaining years uh, in the hospital and is uh, visited uh, daily, um, by his uh, uh, subjects. Um, the Chulung Hospital was, of course, in the center business district, which uh, was the site of the 2010 Red Shirts occupation. And, uh, and the Red Shirts really a um, uh, turning point in terms of losing the um, support of uh, uh, the population through the media was actually when they stormed the hospital. Um, again, I have a <laughs> comparative matrix to finish. Uh, Baltimore post-industrial urban renewal, biomedical complex is new industry, disconnecting from local residents, job skills, serves car-based megalopolis. Uh, in a site uh, where I am and working with the ecological theory of the meta community um, and this idea of a meta city. Um, Bangkok, the crypto colonial royal hospitals now competing with private international hospitals and medical tourism, central to the metropolis. Red shirt occupation 2010, flooding industrial states in 2011, and now this uh, center, the ASEAN Economic Community. Thank you. Looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, Brian. You spoke remarkably closely to some of the themes of the book. Um, can I pull up the last one of the? I'm now too scared to touch this. Mm -hmm. Which one do you um, Your side? Or? Yeah, just if you can pull up. Yeah, go back through. So the point, I think, uh, where I ended and where Brian began was really that there's no single or simple spatial uh, convergence or resolution to this question of the interface between economic and social policy. And one of the challenges, therefore, is that the urban, issues of urban or local are not given 
They're, there's nothing inevitable about them. They're constructed in a certain way and reconstructed uh, through these ideas of health. Now, um, I did want to point out two things to, to you in the audience. One is that um, MIT, in its own urban planning uh, program, um, has just released a, a new study and a new hospital vision 20... Uh, um, uh, 13 uh, program and this is coming up also at the end of the week and it looks at the Cleveland University uh, hospital system and some of the repercussions and they've called it leveraging the power of anchor institutions and community wealth. So whether you frame it in the language of community wealth and if it is indeed community wealth or not is something um, that, that we can uh, certainly raise for, for debate. I also want to say, as one of the intersections with the story uh, Brian was telling us, was uh, when um, I was uh, giving birth to one of my children in Boston, uh, the entire wing, the entire maternity wing of the hospital had been, had been donated by the King of Thailand. So you're talking about strange intersections across the globe. There's one for you. Um, it's a special pleasure to have Stephen Mays here. Um, we are building out some joint programs uh, with uh, Seven Photo and uh, TC Lab, and I've had the privilege of some really terrific conversations with him um, on the role of photojournalism in social media. Um, he's the director of Seven Photo in New York. Uh, he's been secretary to the jury of the World Press Photo since 2004. Um, he also served as chair of the jury in some of the years past. Um, he's worked in uh, photography and areas of photojournalism and journalism, also in art, commercial photography and fashion for about 25 years. Um, prior to joining Seven uh, Photo, uh, he was a senior vice president at Getty Images, uh, and we know how powerful uh, that institution has been uh, in changing the way we look at images. Um, He's worked with uh, Art and Commerce as director of their image archive, and he writes very regularly and broadcasts on, on ethics and realities of uh, photographic practice. Um, Stephen, you've been very vocal about uh, new emerging challenges for how we narrate, uh, as in photojournalism, but also in, in other media. And uh, tell us a little bit about what you think is the biggest communication challenge, and uh, how do you see images of health uh, fitting into this? Let me put this onto the internet. Mm -hmm. and let me set myself up first. I wanted to work from the internet rather than prepared slides prepared slides because some of the things I want to talk about are about the dynamic presentation of images and information. So that, give me a, a moment to set myself up. So what are the challenges? Well, um, in some ways, I think I represent both the challenge, the problem, and the solution, meaning that my business is in photojournalism and journalism is in the business of communication, so our job is to communicate about issues. And therein is, is, I think, the issue, is that my job is to communicate about things I have absolutely no knowledge of or understanding of. And I think this is actually quite a common problem in our many cultures around the world, where the people with the understanding and the knowledge don't have the communication skills, and the people with the communication skills don't have the knowledge or the understanding. And that a lot of my career I've spent trying to bridge that gap. How do we uh, make, bring these expertises together where we can actually begin to talk in, in realistic ways about the issues which are facing us socially, culturally, medically? Because essentially, <clears throat> journalism is about simplification. We're traditionally uh, dealing with mass communications. This, of course, is changing, and I'll talk about that a little later on. And in the process of mass communication, you're taking, uh, you know, it's from the, from the few to the many. You're taking, uh, you're trying to translate the expert knowledge into a language and into a way of understanding which many people can understand. And the easiest way to do that is to simplify it. One of the other characteristics of journalism is that it 
it very often sets up dichotomies of good and bad, which are, I think, often misleading. The consequence of this is that we tend to tell half stories, if that, maybe even third or, or fractions of stories. We, you know, we simplify it down to a point where we're, we're just talking about the key elements and we're simplifying it to here's the good guy, here's the bad guy, and here's the solution. And the w few things in the world are that simple, let alone in medicine and health issues. Uh, there's, an, there's a phrase in the UK where I come from, which is that a half-truth is as good as a lie. I don't know if you have that over here, but it's actually, in my experience, very, unfortunately, very accurate, where part of the problem, therefore, of the journalism is you're telling a half-truth, you may as well be telling lies. You misrepresent situations terribly in the interest of trying to tell any story. Um, so one of the one of the, the I want to talk about various strategies I've adopted to to try and overcome that. One of them, which photography in particular does incredibly well, is to personalise. And we can take a complex story and uh, turn it into the story of a person. And several things happen with that. It becomes very real. You suddenly identify with a person. You can create a visual connection uh, with their lives, their character, their behaviours. And you can also make it very precise. Is it's no longer about statistics, it becomes about what does this mean for an individual? An example I wanted to look at here was the, the story of Dr. Anna Blom, who's one of the visiting doctors of Mount Sinai. And uh, let's see if my keyword system works here. Um, And the story here was about a, a, an initiative from Mount Sinai. It was initiated in 1995 about visiting doctors, helping patients, often in, in terminal conditions. And the story focused, uh, this is by a photographer called Ed Cashy, and the story focused on this one doctor, Dr. Blom. And the reason I kind of wanted to show this online is to show how a simple image carries quite a complex message. And just this, this one gesture of rolling the mouse over the image and seeing the caption information which attaches to each of these different pictures gives you some idea of the problems we're trying to face, which is we have a simple story, which is of this one doctor. And it follows her through the course of a day in New York visiting different patients. So you meet the doctor and you meet the patients. And we're trying to load it with a lot of information. So immediately you begin to see the problem of how do you turn this complex story into something that people can understand. You try and simplify it, and at the same time, here we have you know, somebody rushing out of a taxi in New York. It's very, very identifiable. People can gra grapple with that, and they begin to understand the concept of rushing around and what that means for time, pressure. Um, you know, just photographing these banal activities in itself carries a lot of the story, and yet, of course, the story is massively more complex than that. Um, and of course we meet the doctor and we then also begin to meet the patients. So we, we begin to get the stories of the individual patients. So in some ways, you know, the strategy here is incredibly effective and incredibly ineffective. And it kind of illustrates the, the dichotomy that I was talking about, which is that it, in personalizing it, it uh, becomes very relatable. You understand the issues of, of the story of how do you dispense care to an immobile population. Um, and at the same time, it, 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 it brings it down just to these individuals. And in representing this initiative, which is, I believe, the nation's still the largest visiting doctors initiative, they're dealing with immense numbers of people, immense numbers of issues, uh, terrific med medical complexities. And we've brought it down to these, these very, very basic narrative um, issues. It's both a good thing and a bad thing. I think the other issue, which is very specific to photography, is that to understand a picture, uh, you have to identify with it. So when I was talking earlier about identifying and you know, recognizing a taxi and what, it, what that means in terms of time and pressure and mobility, um, it relies on our previous experience. So in a picture, in a photograph specifically, you have, again, an interesting split, which is very information rich. You have all these elements. You see the person, the location, the tools, the weather, um, you know, the time of day, all this stuff is evident in the photograph. And you get it incredibly quickly. You don't have to read a paragraph to, to understand that. But you also interpret it 
in terms of what you've already understood in your own life, in our own lives. So our preconceptions and our prior knowledge becomes codified into the photographic image. So I'm, I apologize for digressing into the media theory, but I think it's quite relevant. Because when you're dealing with complex issues and you're trying to actually impart information and move people to a different space, uh, photography can get you a long way. It can, can impart a tremendous amount of information very quickly, but it can also nail your foot in the past because you're relying on the, 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 the reader, the reader uh, identifying with what they already know. So it's a bit of a problem. So I'm setting up problems here. I'm hoping to find some solutions as I get towards the end of, the, uh, of my presentation. Because there's another problem, which is this distrib distribution media itself further flattens the story that certainly in the traditional sense, as soon as you put something into a magazine page, it becomes very linear. It tends to become very short as well. But you know, even a, a magazine a feature which may run to six pages these days are, is, is massive. Um, you're talking about six pages, it's very linear, it has a beginning, middle, and end. Uh, the magazine format is, is absolutely built around you know, the introduction, the, the narrative, and the conclusion. It has to have a beginning, middle, and end. Most issues aren't that simple, it can't be so easily resolved, nor can they be told in this very simple, linear format. So one of the, one of the ways we've tried to uh, counter that, photographers have been very inventive around this, is to actually begin to layer the images. So you're dealing in a linear format, but trying to build images which are in themselves layered. And the example I want to show you here is by a photographer called Marcus Bleasdale. Let me find his work. And the story he did uh, a few years back on tuberculosis in Tanzania. And it's Already, just in this first image, you can see it's quite an intriguing strategy, visual strategy. How do you begin to tie all these things together? Well, first of all, of course, we're dealing with the, you know, the caption, the information. There's all, the information itself is very layered, very rich, deep. Uh, but then there's all the background information as well. And what he's done a lot in the story is he's worked with reflections. And here we have a, a street which is, relates both to the outdoors and the indoors. You can see here reflection of a light which is clearly on an indoor space, um, half-seen shadows which you can't quite understand, and then these figures walking down the street. So you get this sense of community and private, which he then develops through the course of the story, where he develops these layers uh, using, um, you know, in itself, tells, this picture tells you very little about tuberculosis, but engages you. You have to begin to understand what's happening in this picture. What, who is this woman? What's she dealing with? Where's the, the blue? Um, some of them very straight, literal shots of here's a patient uh, with, with uh, assistance. And to my mind, one of the pictures which is really key in this whole set is this one, which does it beautifully, where you have both the community visible and you have the specialist care expert on hand. Uh, and notably holding a pen, not a, not a, not a stethoscope or a syringe. You know, so you have, immediately you have this information layered into this picture of you know, it, of the, the, the expert who was plainly dressed for uh, medical action, also dealing with data and the community. So it's, it's, very, it's very clever stuff. Um, it, it maybe works, it maybe doesn't. It is very complex. I think the, the failing in this image, if there is a failing, is, and the story, is that the pictures then become maybe too complex where you're dealing in an environment where people want to have instant hits. You want to hear, you want to see, you want to understand very, very quickly. So everything's built around sound bites. And suddenly you have an image like this where you have to really dig in and explore. However, what I think the success of it is that it does invite the exploration. And I think that's one of the keys that we work with a lot in our, in our visual strategies is trying to set up stories visually in ways that intrigue the viewer sufficiently to read the caption. Because one of the things I believe very, very strongly is that uh, I've, I've often heard journalists being blamed for failing to tell stories properly. And I, I would rephrase that slightly. I would say that it's very, I think it, actually it is on us, the viewers, it's our responsibility to understand what we're looking at. And that very often it's too easy to pass the blame onto others. Um, and various uh, pejoratives applied to journalists, journalists like you know, vultures, uh, dilettantes, uh, you know, all the, the, the terms which uh, 
sadly are often true, but are also, again, an incomplete telling of the journalist's role. Um, I think that really the responsibility lies on us. And if we, can, if we can stimulate a viewer to ask the questions, I think that's our job, much more than actually providing all the answers. Because plainly, photography, with all the limitations that I've just described, is never going to tell the whole story. And we have to accept that. And therefore, the visual strategy has to become one of introducing complexity in a way that's sufficiently appetizing for people to look into it. Um, I think that there are solutions, and I think the solutions are largely technological. And one of the satisfactions I'm enjoying at the moment is the, the richness of the internet, of being able to communicate no longer simply in linear formats, but in layered formats, where the, the internet absolutely invites um, exploration in, in many different layers at the same time, with hyperlinks and connections and infographics, uh, audio, video, stills, graphic, and everything is, is piled in. <coughs> Excuse me. And the viewer <clears throat> then becomes free to browse. <clears throat> and that, to me, is a huge, huge liberation that is, I think is allowing for the journalism to find a, a place for itself in the way that it never has been able to before. We're able to deal with complex elements, layered narratives, and more to the point, complex responses. And this is very, very new, where previously in trying to communicate about issues, we would put it on a magazine page, <clears throat> millions of copies would be run off, they'd be distributed, you don't know where they went, you don't know who read them, you don't know how they responded, but you know more than often than not, they would turn the page and at the end of the magazine throw it away. And that was your job done. And what we have now working online is a much richer environment where people are actually uh, encouraged to respond. And the, the range of responses is immense. It can be as simple as liking something, sharing it with a friend, sending somebody a link, posting it on Twitter, uh, all of which is fairly basic. You can post a comment. You can bring information to the story which wasn't available to the journalist. You can critique the story. You can say, actually, you said it was A, but actually, in fact, it's B. Uh, you can correct information. Uh, you can provide extra information. You can volunteer. You can donate. There's an extraordinary range of things. So when I talk about the responsibility coming back onto the viewer, again, I think this is a time which is coming to, to into its own, where we as as viewers of information, I don't know what the journalology is now, we as the community handling information, both as creators, distributors, and receivers, uh, we do make a complete community. And as viewers, we are now actually active participants in a way that was never possible before. And I want to just uh, demonstrate a particular tool which is um, just released and I'm very excited about at the moment, which, excuse me, well, I, I just key in these this address. I think that's it. Yes. Uh, and the new tool is called Stipple. It's, you know, there's, there's software being launched all the time, obviously, and we're all overwhelmed by the apps, and you know, can't keep up with the technology. This particular one has really, really grabbed my imagination. This is not a, a story by one of my photographers, uh, but I asked one of the uh, developers behind the software uh, to, to show me a story which really demonstrated the, the attributes. It's a photograph and it's a caption, very similar to what we just looked at on the, the Seven Photo website, um, which is very much putting the information in front of people and inviting you to, to read it and engage. This goes a considerable stage further. As you roll over the image, you begin to see other little buttons. You go, oh, what's that? Suddenly you have a map. You know who the author is. You can click on this link here, which will take you to the, the photographer. Uh, you can click on the map for more information. You, this little button here is, in fact, a video. Uh, you click the video, and it's a very powerful story about uh, you know, behind this image. You scroll down. Um, how do you scroll down on one of these machines? Um, and on each one of these images, there's different buttons with different, different information attached to it. And what's delightful about this is, it is, in every sense, it's a layered experience where the viewer is seeing an image and then is delving 
deeper into each one of them. Here's a caption, a back, you know, another photograph of the scene. So you're not only seeing what's in front of the camera, the photographers have the, the uh, gumption to turn around and photograph behind it. So you suddenly see more about the scene in the same picture, as well as the information and the map and all the rest of it. It's completely non-intrusive. So you only find the information if you're curious. And this to me is one of the key changes that we're living through. This notion of being one of the few speaking to the many is uh, and talking to addressing an audience who you don't know, you don't know if they care, they're looking for simple solutions. Suddenly you're you're hitting all those same audiences, but you're also hitting audiences who are genuinely interested. And you know, someone who's motivated to roll their mouse over this image or any other and begin to look at these drop down menus is someone who you're now engaging with in a totally a uh, different way, deeper way, than just turning a magazine page. So really what I'm talking about here is, is the tools at our disposal. You know, how do we talk about the complexities in, in healthcare? And I, I'm very optimistic about all this. I, I've worked in this business for 25 years or more, and I've always been frustrated by the limitations. You know, my first health piece, I think, was in 91, around HIV and AIDS. Uh, and trying to deal with that in, in imagery was a, a deeply frustrating issue where um, you know, there were, at that time there were many people photographing symptoms uh, of, of illness, uh, which were profoundly uninforming of the issues behind the illness, which were essentially, you know, there was an epidemiology which people were struggling to understand, there were issues of treatment and prevention, uh, there was, therefore there was health prevention issues, and of course very profoundly there were social issues. And how, does one, how do you do that by photographing a picture of someone, you know, symptomatic person with HIV, it was really, really a, a profoundly frustrating uh, experience. Uh, through to now, where we have these astonishing tools, where we can really begin to engage with the complexities in, in very profound ways. And one of the satisfactions I've had in, in recent years is working with Doctors Without Borders and a couple of projects we've done, most recently on neglected diseases, uh, which is a perfect combination of you know, why are neglected diseases neglected, very often it's because they're not getting the attention or the media coverage or the understanding. Therefore, you know, to partner with a you know, communications team is you know, a great synergy. And uh, just two years ago, we did a piece on uh, malnutrition, which is, again, a very layered and complex subject with many different forms of manifestation and, indeed, very often is asymptomatic. So what do you photograph? And I think that Jason is going to talk a little bit about uh, some of those issues and how we, we solve those solve those challenges. I think the point that uh, Stephen, you were making, um, you know, not not from the few to the many, uh, which is has often been how narrative, at least one of the constructs of narrative. Um, I think is very interesting because when I was talking uh, at the beginning and I put up the slide which showed a drop in under five mortality rates, um, I think the New York Times said that uh, this was, I think, in December, they said it was actually quite a good year for health uh, in the sense that the statistics were looking quite good um, uh, overall uh, worldwide in terms of how many uh, under fives uh, around the world had actually lived um, through to the new year. And they put one of the reasons that the authors had initially explained for that was not uh, rising incomes, although incomes, of course, do matter, um, but the importance of, of uh, education and information. And I have a feeling we're heading into a, um, in, into a very new century uh, in that sense, um, in, times, uh, in terms of the information we can get out. Um, so on the theme of education, um, I'm extremely happy to have um, Patricia Thomas here with us today. Um, she's uh, coming from much warmer climates uh, in Athens, Georgia. Uh, Pat has been writing about medicine, public health, and life science research for more than 30 years. Um, she's the night chair in health and medical journalism um, at the University of Georgia. And um, she has been looking quite closely at underserved communities in the U.S. South and been writing quite a bit on um, the uh, intersection of training journalists uh, and, and getting uh, certain messages out which are quite on point on specific health issues, which she will 
discuss. Um, she has established some very interesting publishing opportunities for graduate students and invested considerable effort towards uh, training working journalists also for the digital age that um, Stephen has been referring to. Uh, Pat, you seem to have been remarkably active in arguing for both new attention to the U.S. South and uh, to training people to communicating across disciplinary and sector divides. Uh, tell us a little bit more about this work and are you optimistic? Thank you. Thank you, Smita, for having me here. I don't get north of the Mason-Dixon line uh, as often as I did when I taught in Boston and was a journalist there. Um, I'm going to build on some of the things that have been said, and I'm going to prove to you that you can tell a story in under seven minutes. Um, like Brian, I'm going to reach into some personal experience. Uh, like Smita, I'm going to talk about some big, uh, big, big topics of global importance. And like Steve and I, I'm very concerned with how, how stories are uh, are told. And I'm hoping that one of these guys moves this forward. Ah, yeah, here we go. I'm going to tell you a story uh, about a big issue, tobacco. Uh, moving upstream from how countries and cities and people respond to disease, to talk about things that really cause disease. And furthermore, this is a personal story. It begins with a good girl from a small town in the American South, uh, who of course did not smoke. Uh, because when I grew up, and that is me playing the wash tub bass, that's a very sophisticated instrument. Some of you may not have encouraged it, it encountered it. It's indigenous to the South. Um, when I grew up, fathers smoked because there had been cigarettes in their K rations uh, when they fought in World War II. Uh, mothers did not really smoke, despite what you may have seen in things like The Help, uh, which dealt with a lot of mothers who were a lot richer than the mothers that I knew. And in my little high school world, uh, bad boys and uh, girls of uh, suspect morals, uh, they smoked. But anyway, this, this good girl uh, packed off for college uh, with that note, the clarinet case, the villager outfit, and the Samsonite suitcase, for those of you who are old enough, uh, with those, uh, those mindsets in, intact. After all, you'd have to be an idiot to smoke. Uh, the Surgeon General had even told us that it was really, really dangerous. That, that seminal report came out in 1964. And in fact, even the cigarette packages themselves had these warnings, these ominous warnings that uh, told us that this stuff was pretty much uh, going to kill us. But what happens? What happens when you go away to college? What happens when you go away to college in the 1960s in particular? Well, fans, this, this happens. <laughs> There, there was a cultural revolution afoot, and young people were doing everything that their parents had told them not to do. We were the people our parents warned us against, and we were proud of it. Sex, drugs, rock and roll, growing long hair, resisting the draft, having street protests, making fun of people who lived in ranch houses in the suburbs. Uh, all of that happened. And we went from the culture where bad girls and bad boys smoked to the culture where the people that we wanted to be, they smoked. You may recognize the young Bob Dylan there. Um, it, smoking uh, of uh, cigarettes and other things became part of, of our radical political culture. Uh, yes, that is yours truly on the right with the shades and the Indian cigarettes, Smita may recognize the BDs. That's my roommate who's been teaching medieval history for decades now at major universities. Um, and uh, behind us is the uh, Stop the Draft Week poster, which you don't see too many of anymore. But the point is that you just could not have a political strategy meeting. You couldn't have a protest. Uh, without uh, cigarettes. I, the other day I listened to Simon and Garfunkel's We've All Gone to Search for America song, and within the first three lines, it asks whether we have any cigarettes or not. And another line a little later says, no, nah, we smoked the last one an hour ago. So um, yeah, cigarettes were pretty indigenous to this whole uh, culture. When I went to journalism school at Stanford, we had a professor, Cliff Weigel, who stood at the front of the room and 
smoked in a very leisurely fashion all through class. And I remember smoking in lecture halls and stubbing the cigarettes out with my feet. I remember smoking in the, in the movies, in fact. It was really an amazing uh, time. And remember, you know, this was at a time when uh, the U.S. had an enormous tobacco industry and a lot of policies, economic and political, aimed at preserving that industry. Well, I pretty soon left California and moved back to the South. Yep, there I am smoking. I think that's in New Mexico or Arizona, some dry place. And the uh, uh, the U-Haul van is just out of the view of the of the camera there. But anyway, I ended up in Atlanta, Georgia, where I lived for many years. And uh, boy, in the South, you could really smoke anywhere. You know, since 1938, there had been these public policies that that uh, propped up the price of tobacco and paid regulated the amount of tobacco on the market by paying people with tobacco allotments not to grow tobacco. So the people who did grow tobacco and bring it to market that year got more money for it. This was a deliberate strategy. We taxpayers poured billions of dollars into this. And in the South, you know, in Georgia, they grew tobacco. So, you know, cigarettes were very, very, very um, cheap there. And, uh, you know, one of the strangest stories from this period is that I actually knew people who uh, bought property in North Carolina to start a yoga retreat center. And they deliberately bought a parcel of land that had a tobacco allotment. Because then they were paid not to grow tobacco, which being non-smoking Zen Buddhists from California, they wouldn't have done anyway. But they subsidized the building of the Southern Dharma Center with tobacco allotment. There's definitely got to be some weird irony thing going on there. Um, anyway, you can really smoke in all of my friends' houses. And you know, it was just really part of life. Don't ask about what the sheep is doing there. I'm really not uh, sure. But you know, I remember a hundred bar discussions in Atlanta, the bars where the journalists hung out and people would talk long into the night about how, no, nah, you could never regulate the sale or the use of tobacco in the United States because, damn it, it was a legal product like alcohol. You were just never going to see that happen. That's how it looked from the South. But now, now, fans, things change a little bit because that urban narrative that, that Smita spoke about in her book, that you cannot speak of India as one coherent place, that all these cities, things behave differently there. Well, in the United States, you know, we're no more homogeneous. And so what happened to me? Well, welcome to Boston. I, I moved to Boston in the mid-'80s to take a fellowship, a science writing fellowship at MIT, and boy, was that ever a different world. If you're spending all your time at MIT, that was the Science Journalism Fellowships, to which I'm eternally grateful. Um, if you're spending all your time on the campuses of MIT and Harvard, and it's the mid-'80s, then you are freezing your buns off on a loading dock, smoking with the guys who drive the trucks, because you know there's no smoking in those buildings there. Now, is it true that I wanted to quit smoking? Well, you bet I did. For God's sake, I made my living writing about medicine. So I'd cover cardiology meetings and pulmonary medicine meetings, and then I'd sneak outside the New Orleans Convention Center to smoke. And somehow in my innocence, I would think that the doctors couldn't smell it on me, you know, when I went back in. And now you know that's all not true. Of course they knew. But you know, it was a horribly addictive product, and it was a really hard product to give up. And every time I thought I'd quit smoking, something bad would happen. My father would get Alzheimer's disease, somebody would die. You know, there was always a reason, an excuse not to quit smoking. But the pressures were powerful, powerful in this new environment where I was living in Massachusetts. And no one smoked there. No cool people smoked there except Italians. Italians still smoked, and they were cool. But, you know, no one there was making their living off growing tobacco. I mean, they actually grow a little leaf tobacco somewhere in Massachusetts, but it wasn't a big thing. It wasn't like living in the South. And it was a state that had a strong public health culture, a tradition of the belief that government could do something good that would benefit the majority of the people the majority of the time, and the government should actually do those things. I mean, it was weird Massachusetts, after all. So here is one of the last pictures of me that I can find, maybe the last picture I can ever find of me with a cigarette. There I am, I got the crazy short hair. 
I got the drink in my hand and that's a stub of a cigarette there in my fingers and that's my first standard poodle Quentin he was a lovely dog I have another standard poodle now but you know the thing that really did it for me 1987 Cambridge Cambridge banned smoking indoors, restaurants, bars, clubs. And you know what people said? Said there'd be no more restaurants and bars. They'd all go out of business. Of course, we know, I think, most of us who've been to Cambridge recently, that definitely is not true. Still a destination dining place. But that is, that's the point for me, that that was the tipping point. I am living proof that public policy can change individual behavior, can change social behavior, and can in fact change the world over time, which is possibly why I still see some optimism in teaching young people how to practice responsible ethical journalism where we actually know something about what we cover. Stephen's point about journalists don't know the stuff they're covering, people need to get their big messages out, they don't know nothing about journalism. Well, it doesn't have to be that way. You can actually be a specialized reporter right here at Columbia, your journalism school also believes that. It's a really important thing. And one of the things that I do is I teach students that there are always through at least three classic frames for every story about health. First of all, all stories about health, they're complicated. They're just as complicated as the 25-year narrative I just unfurled in front of you in under seven minutes if I have met my task. But there are always three frames. Frames are just a way of limiting stuff so you can wrap your hands around it and it doesn't all seem so messy and chaotic and every story isn't, can't be about everything so you gotta kinda narrow it down. There's the personal narrative, the kinda narrative I just told you. There's, that, puts the, that puts a human in the front of the story. Steven's work does a lot of that. Brian did that very effectively, talking about AIDS and about the care of his elderly relatives. But there's also the cultural, the cultural narrative. That's the kind of frame that works very well. And then there's the narrative that looks at the structural factors, poverty, industry, market dynamics, which Smita's book does a wonderful job. You know, where you really see this, if you're just the regular consumer of news, it's on the opinion pages, because on the opinion page, the editorials, the op-eds, that's where one pundit is going to tell you, all these people are fat and sick because they made bad choices. And then the pundit in the next column is going to say to you, nah, it's the cultural beliefs that cause people to engage in risky behavior or fail to seek care when they should. And then there's a third pundit who will say to you, well, it's really not their fault because there's these huge institutional and, and market dynamic forces that we're all powerless um, against. But I think my story in, indicates a mix of the three. Influenced by culture, I didn't smoke. Influenced by a revolution in culture, I became an addict about smoking. Then cultural shifts and public policy pushed me away from doing that. So all complex narratives about health, health care, public health can be told in many ways. This little story I told you here, it's just an example of how one journalist tells one story out of millions. So I'm hoping we have a little conversation tonight about other ways of looking at that. And thank you for your time. Pat is setting the bar high here. All right. Uh, Jason. Um, Jason Cohn, uh, one of our speakers who in his uh, current work sees extreme health distress at close quarters and under uh, some of the most extreme political conditions. We're very pleased to have him here with us today. He's communications director for Doctors Without Borders, what some of you know as Médecins Sans Frontières in the US. Um, in this capacity, he has overseen crisis and advocacy communications campaigns for MSF and all kinds of emergencies, um, such as the uh, Haiti earthquake, which many of you have been following. And uh, he has also curated uh, photographic exhibits and um, such as uh, the photographs from Afghanistan, looking at into war-torn Afghanistan with Doctors Without Borders. He's also the executive producer of the Emmy-nominated Starve for Attention, a documentary series on childhood malnutrition. Um, I last heard Jason speak on a panel on uh, photojournalism and ethics uh, of reporting and he argued for quite an integrative approach to emergency situations and basic needs. And MSF has probably been one of those few organizations out there that has 
been very consistently on point and has been extremely imaginative about the ways they get their message across. Um, I want to ask Jason, um, while he's speaking to us today, what have been some of his major influences in the narratives, uh, in the work he has supervised, and what does he see as some of the major challenges uh, for his work at MSF? Thank you, Smita. Um, so I'm going to, you know, as I was sitting here listening to other speakers, sort of you sort of reimagine your presentation over and over again with all the night, all the really interesting, intriguing things they they brought up. But I want to do focus on a one particular campaign that I worked on also very closely here with uh, with Stephen Mays that looked at the issue of childhood malnutrition. Um, as Smita mentioned, I work for an organization that works in about 70 countries. We're a medical humanitarian organization that takes us to many different places takes us to Syria, it takes us to Haiti, it takes us to South Africa, covering a whole broad swath of uh, issues from HIV to tuberculosis to the neglect diseases uh, that Stephen was mentioning and some of the work we've also done together. Um, what we really do in the communications work that I do is less about sort of generating general awareness of issues and more about the problems that our doctors and our medical team see in the field. Uh, we're inherently an inpatient organization. Uh, we don't really like waiting for things like economic development to happen. We are constantly in a mode of dealing with crisis situations uh, where people are dying, and that creates a, a great level of impatience with systems that are dysfunctional. Um, we're working, obviously, in societies that are in major disruption, whether they be wars, natural disasters, huge epidemics of different diseases. Um, so we come into this space very with a very specific sort of imperative which is to try and save lives and alleviate suffering uh, and one of those issues that our doctors were confronting over and over again is this issue of childhood malnutrition as you see on this slide which is a which is essentially the cover of a, a menu of a dvd which is uh, eight films that we produced um, there's a, an eighth film that uh, is not on this dvd but it's on our website starforattention.org that looks at the issue of childhood malnutrition, which is, affects about 195 million children at this moment, any moment, uh, based on the best estimations. And so uh, after talking for many years with our pediatricians, our doctors in the field, we had been moving from crisis to crisis, treating uh, hundreds of thousands of children uh, a year um, in very frustrating situations, uh, seeing sort of a perpetual cycle. But one thing that we consistently saw in terms of our ability to rehabilitate these children was the um, sort of connective tissue of what became this campaign was that the quality of the food, the nutritional quality of the food uh, was, uh, if you took away all the other variables, the fact that the kids were found in places that were highly impoverished, all the different social, cultural, economic issues, if you could somehow find a way to get nutritious food into young children's bodies, they would have uh, a much better chance at surviving. The sort of like improvements in uh, under five mortality that Smuna was talking about that were reported recently in the, the New York Times in the story in December. So in, in many ways, we are doing a, an effort to sort of simplify an issue, a very complex issue, in, in an effort to sort of move a particular uh, agenda forward. Uh, in our case, it happened to be uh, saving more children from, uh, from malnutrition. Uh, and so one of the things that we did in the discussions of, of, of that we've learned through all of our sort of campaigns is, is the very importance of making problems visible. Um, but also asking uh, very fundamental and somewhat um, provocative questions as well in the course of that kind of advocacy and communications, uh, which is in this case was, you know, why in this day and age were we not getting something uh, into the bodies of children. It, didn't, it wasn't a disease that needed a vaccine, a very complex treatment, these things. Just simply constantly asking that questions of uh, different political actors, stakeholders, and such. And so we tried to do that in one way, in, in collaboration, which I think is, is very important um, in this day and age of communication, is taking experts, the people that we work, that I worked with in the field, uh, pediatricians, doctors, people who have been carrying out this work, and working with a talented group of photojournalists, in this case uh, from Seven Photo Stevens Agency, and trying to break down and distill a very complex issue uh, along many, several different lines. Uh, this story took us to uh, a number of different countries, as you can see here. Um, in the case of the Djibouti story, it was really a story about uh, a team of uh, MSF doctors working in an urban environment, 
constantly having to deal with a stream of malnourished children, uh, frustrated at the inability to sort of stop that, that stream. So really to highlight the point that this is a problem much bigger than one organization itself, but we were very well placed to see the problem in its most acute uh, form. And then other films took us to war zones, a uh, place like the Democratic Republic of Congo. Some of you may have heard there's been a long lasting war there. It's also one of the most fertile places on earth in terms of agriculture. Uh, yet you find malnourished children there because of the war, because of the little access that they have to the types of food and nutrition they need. We also went to places like Mexico, which has a huge national system uh, that, was, um, that has been done great things in terms of reducing uh, malnutrition. We also looked at the U.S. We looked at the, what we've done here in the Women, Infant, Child program over many decades to sort of de decrease childhood malnutrition. But we also looked at the inherent contradictions of our, US, our foreign policy when it comes to the food that we provide overseas. And in that case, again, I come back to sort of how the questions you ask and how you provoke them. And in that case, and I encourage you to go onto the website and watch all the films. I'll show you one of them uh, in just a moment, was the fact that you know, why are we feeding, essentially, this question of why are we feeding malnourished, malnourished children food we would never give to our own, the food here back in the U.S., sort of asking this question, because that, in fact, is what we do in many cases, or we have done it since the start of this, this campaign, uh, at least uh, five years ago, which was provide substandard food and the food aid that goes to most emergencies around the world that you see, the Ethiopias, the, you know, the Darfurs, and so forth. And so for us, it was about asking these kind of provocative questions of the people that make decisions. Um, in the case of the film that I'm going to show you, uh, <clears throat> A Mother's Devotion, this is Natasha uh, with her son, Alexi. Alexi had been, in, you know, as you'll see in the film, admitted to one of our programs in Bikina Faso for malnutrition. But one of the things I think if you see in a lot of the visual uh, imagery around uh, malnutrition is you see in a lot of contexts, obviously, it's the, in, the, in the African, sub-Saharan African context, uh, you see imagery of mothers, and oftentimes presented in a way of sort of being, uh, failing their children. They're in a hospital setting, they've somehow failed uh, to provide their children. But what we tried to do, at least in this particular film that we worked with Jessica Dimmick, one of the photographers, was to kind of bring to the forefront the inconsistencies inherent in holding mothers to blame for children's poor diets. Uh, it reinforces uh, the g general but essential point that improvements in public health require not only intellectual arguments but also a political action in order to widen the perspective on certain visions of the world. In this case, the view that health systems must take responsibility for the quality of young children's diets. This is what we do here in the U.S. We create a social safety net that ensures that young children, uh, pregnant women, have access to nutritious foods. It is billion dollars a year of subsidy. Yet, in most cases, when you talk about uh, malnutrition or you get in policy discussions about it, it's somehow about changing the behavior of mothers. Uh, they're not breastfeeding properly. There are all these other problems that are so removed from the way we've actually addressed uh, childhood malnutrition in industrialized, uh, uh, developed countries and the way we've wiped it out and the way you would see if, uh, in Mexico, for example, with a concerted state-level effort. So with that, I'll show you the film. I think it will bring out some of the issues and the ways that we're trying to uh, distill some of these complex issues, but in this case also confront some of the uh, sort of the tropes that exist as well. I traveled with Doctors Without Borders to Burkina Faso in October of 2009. It's 20 minutes to 9 p.m. local time. The outside temperature is 21 degrees centigrade. Will you please respect the limited safety instructions? We ask you to be careful when opening the overhead sandwiches and to make sure that you forget nothing on board. MSF operates a clinic called the Creme in Burkina Faso. And the kids that are there are extremely ill.
s'il est régulièrement du poids. Il atteint certains critères et on le sort. Since the Crenny treats only children with medical complications, the overwhelming majority of malnourished kids are treated not at the Crenny, but instead as outpatients in 20 village-level treatment centers, where they come for checkups and to replenish their supply of ready-to-use therapeutic food. And at the treatment center in Samba, we met Natasha and her son Alexei, who is being treated for malnutrition. I remember her on that first day saying, you know, I can show you how little food I have left for the year. Les jours que je suis quitté à l'hôpital avec l'enfant, quand je suis arrivé à Samba, je me la mets dans le bras. Les Ils m'ont dit que l'enfant est malade. Nos yeux sont calmés. Moi, j'ai demandé à comprendre. Je suis revenu à la maison. Ça va mieux. Je vais aller chercher le bois. C'est à 5 heures du matin. La région, c'est quand je viens vendre le bois. Parce que son père n'est pas là. Autour de moi, mais il y a tout. Il y a poisson. Le poisson est dans les aliments du vitamine. Donc c'est pourquoi je préfère le poisson. Parce que la viande ne suffit pas. Si je paye le poisson, ou bien je paye de la viande arrivée à la maison. Si le corps de l'enfant est chaud, donc je n'aurai pas l'argent. Je viens pas aller payer les comprimés. Donc j'ai payé savon, le sel, puis je m'avais payé pétrole. Puis je continue à aller à la maison. Il pas mangé. Donc je commence à couper un peu, un peu pour venir manger. Il faut aller couper, venir sécher le pilet pour vous parler pour les enfants. S'il n'y a plus de manger et que ça reste un peu, ah, je donne le reste à les enfants. Je peux faire une semaine même avant de continuer à manger. Je pense à mes enfants, à moi-même aussi, ma vie. Comment faire pour continuer ma vie Donc, s'il si fait nuit, je pense, je ne sais pas comment terminer la vie. Je pourrais dire que ça soit changé. <rire> si Dieu est grand, peut-être ça va changer. Mais actuellement, je ne sais pas d'abord.
we would talk about some of these different issues. Yeah. Why, don't, why don't I invite some of the panelists over? And Jason, thank you very much for that. And we can take a few questions from the audience. Yeah, I think in, uh, in this case, um, you know, we connected a sort of an advocacy campaign, a, a petition uh, about changing sort of the quality of the food aid uh, to the films. And I mean, the project in itself had a, was uh, covered in about 25 different countries. We had exhibits in a dozen other countries. So the audience was very different, I think, in many, in many senses. Um, you know, in this case of this film, in this particular one, we were again sort of trying to attack some of the tropes around sort of uh, mothers in the African context sort of being uh, the source of the problem in essence and, and it, trying to expose just the everyday life uh, that Natasha, the struggles that she was facing, mm -hmm. the fact that she knew what she needed but really had to make economic choices, risk, you know, certain choices that she had to, to balance. And one of the things that sort of, you, um, you get in some of the other films is the fact that technological innovation in the form of ready-to-use therapeutic foods, which has allowed our organization to treat tenfold the number of malnourished children that we were able to treat just five or six years ago, um, is in, in our case we think of a, tech, a sort of a health innovation because it empowers the patient, right? Uh, Natasha can bring her son home. She doesn't have to stay in that hospital environment. He's malnourished, but he's not that sick. And so I think when we talk about sort of solutions to some of these uh, intertractable sort of like health issues, like a, something that is huge as 195 million children being malnourished, um, we're talking about also about the tools that the technology in terms of health and pharmaceuticals delivers is something that's relevant to the people most affected. And uh, um, so for us, this was about uh, reaching policymakers to make a, make a change, put public pressure on them. To, to be asked tough questions of how that you're, you're providing food in this humanitarian aid system, isn't that enough? No, it's not enough. It, it, it's not enough in that sense. So. Um, the audience, if you want to ask a question, there's uh, people with mics around. Is there a question in the back there? Anyone? Okay. One of the things I wanted to ask you about was you, you had referred to getting uh, her being able to bring her baby home. Yeah. And one of the things, um, that seems to have got a lot of narrative use. I know in South Asia are mobile crashes for that reason and mobile um, systems where buses go out to communities and they either have uh, solutions on them of various kinds or they have uh, a way of uh, making their way into kind of the lexicon of people's everyday lives. They, they, can, they can do uh, some of that. Brian, do you have a sense that in urban design, the vocabulary is changing to deal with these kinds of problems? Um, unfortunately not. I mean, I think um, what I just, you know, again, just provoked by uh, your invitation to, to look at um, just one aspect, the hospitals, and, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and then um, in my own life, the sort of you know, sort of geography of, of treatment um, is uh, it, it's it's building specific. I mean, there's an architecture to it, but I don't think in urbanism. And so um, the, uh, the the Thai example is, and, and they're 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 amazing because in terms of your uh, interest in evolution, for some reason the the whole genealogy of the building type is is mm -hmm. sacred. You the the original buildings are all all there. So the uh, uh, in Baltimore Infirmary, 1835, is still there in the medical complex. Mm -hmm. The original John Hopkins buildings from 1887, I believe. The, uh, the same period, the Sarat uh, original building is still there. And, and yet they're kind of uh, 
in the midst of these incredible <laughs> agglomerations of the latest technology, and technology is always driving, mm -hmm. uh, driving the next building, and um, and um, and they all need to sort of be internally linked, but completely more and more separate from the cities in which they're situated, and so. Um, <laughs> And um, uh, so I, I, I don't, I think, unfortunately, you're not, it's not. You're, you're not seeing that. <laughs> um, and and uh, uh, Pat, you, you had um, described this as, as sort of three frames in which one is able to tell, to narrate well. And um, is there a chance to open up that conversation in every single instance of a new audience? Or do you see yourself in your own forms of narrative picking certain styles? Do you see a style in the way you write? Well, I mean, it's all about audience. It's always all about audience. I mean, scholars are writing primarily for other scholars. And journalists, you know, we're in this weird position because we try to understand things with something of the sophistication of a scholar, but to make it accessible to larger numbers of people. Now, would I tell a story uh, differently, or would I encourage my students to tell stories differently from an audience of college students, from an audience of uh, people over, uh, wealthy, well-insured people over 65 uh, who subscribe to the Harvard Health Letter, which I once was the editor of? Of course I would. You know, it's, it's always about audience. There is no platonic world of forms story, like there could be a platonic chair that partakes of all cheeriness. But it doesn't work that way with stories, you know. It's always about audience. And, and people are constantly finding new ways of telling stories. And some of the things that Stephen spoke about, I mean, the social media platforms, and the, ability, the ability to aggregate and pull together many different voices and to uh, organize these in a way that helps the reader, viewer, or user tell which voices are more credible than others. Mm -hmm. That's one of the big one of the big challenges I think that, that journalists are are forced, facing now. We want to crowdsource our stories and we want the voices of the people who are are in the public square where the protest uh, is taking place or who are in the clinic where the acute health emergency is happening or in Bellevue Hospital when it's flooding or you know mm -hmm. what have you. Uh, and, but as journalists, we also want to verify because we're part of a, a discipline that believes that our role for the audience is to help them uh, separate the trivial from the important and the ridiculous from the probably something you can believe. So it's always changing. May, but may I just? Yeah, please. I, I mean, I, I just um, Pat was struck by your personal, cultural, and structural. Uh, tried and um, and I think I was trying to do that. I think you were too. Yeah. <laughs> and um, not enough time for the structural. And so, um, how do you? The, the structural is so complex. How, I mean, in, in the it seems the personal cultural is accessible. Uh, how, how do you tell the structural story? Well, I mean, if you're telling stories, we're often my students are often often covering stories about health in the South, and the health disparities. Uh, a, along the lines of poverty and race, which in Georgia are very close to the same lines, although there are an awful lot of poor white people in Georgia as well. And I think that almost all of my students' stories constantly make allusion to, uh, to wealth and health. I mean, they just, it's so drilled into them. Mm -hmm. You know, they will almost always include in the story information about how much money, how much resources, mm -hmm. might not tell you, they don't invade the privacy of right. a single mother and say that her income is $14,000 a year, but they'll say you know, that her children qualify for mm -hmm. uh, SCHEP programs mm -hmm. and that she's on Medicaid. So I mean, I think that is just always integrated in, but what hooks the reader, what hooks the reader is usually the personal story. Mm -hmm. But Stephen, you were saying, you were giving us, and, and this is my last question for the panel, you were giving us a little, um, a slightly different story. You were telling us that our audience has changed and sometimes we're not even aware of it. I think that's right. I mean, it's, it's, and we're not aware of it because we don't really understand the new tools that we're dealing with and how they work. And it's, for me, it's, I'm tremendously optimistic about it because, as I say, I have found tremendous frustration with some of the traditional forms of 
distribution and formatting of stories. Mm -hmm. And I think what we have now are, are, are new tools which are allowing us to do things in, in much more expansive, richer, deeper ways, but we don't yet really understand what we're dealing with. Uh, one of the things I didn't mention, which is very relevant to your question about the audiences, is the, the tools, of course, are not just about how we distribute stuff, but also how we receive things. And one of the things we're, we're learning slowly is that the significance of a message received on a cell phone as a text is very different from the significance of the same message received on a television as part of a broadcast. Mm -hmm. And you know how, as, as, as a tool for receiving information, how that personalized, intimate delivery absolutely changes our relationship with that information, makes it more imperative, more interesting, more engaging in every way. These are things we're just dipping our toes into. Um, but the audience is changing, and I, I include myself in the audience. I find I am changing. My relationship with information is changing. And by that I mean it's not, when I talk about the relationship with information, it's not just the volume of information. It's not just that I get more. It's not just that I'm, I'm hearing it from different sources. But in the same way that the, I, to me the analogy is with the printing press, where it wasn't just a way of getting more words to more people. It introduced literacy. From literacy came the Renaissance, led to the, you know, the growth of science, the Industrial Revolution. It, it, you know, from the printing press, our relationship with information had profound effects on how we related to the world. And I, I feel we're at that similar position now, where we're, something very big is happening under our feet. We don't really know what it is, what it will lead to. But uh, absolutely, the, the audience is changing. I am changing as an audience. I mean, I think that, that leaves us on quite an optimistic note for, for the issue of health and, and speaking to a wider audience. I'd like to uh, invite all of you to come and uh, meet the speakers at the end, but I want you to uh, join me in giving them a big hand. Thank you very much. Thank you.